Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me here. Um, thank you for attending. Uh, as you heard, I uh, work out of Microsoft's head office in Redmond um, and of the chief technology officer of our services business, and I travel around the world a lot uh, looking at what customers are doing, what partners are doing, um, how our business should be changing. And so an event like this is always interesting for me to sort of get feedback from you about what you're hearing, what we're doing, are we doing the right things, are we satisfying your needs? And so what I'll try and talk about today is what we've called communication and collaboration uh, and the next wave, and what I'll, really in two parts. Part of it I'll try and cover where um, we are as a company, what our strategy is, the breadth of technologies that we've got, and then when I'm done with that, we'll get into a little bit more of a deeper piece which is around in the e-marketing um, area, what are the technologies that we're looking at, what are some of the strategies, what are some of the visions that we've got, and then what are some of the more tactical pieces that uh, you can do today. So the place then to start is to actually sit back a little bit and think about some of the changes that we've seen in technologies to some degree over the last 20 years, where we've seen these changes occurring really in three big areas. The first one is in the PC, from the original PC from IBM, to the netbooks of today, and the touch panels that we'll see in the future. The second area is that of the phone, and what's happened in the phone, where the view has just changed so dramatically and so quickly about what is on a phone today. Today's phone, and we announced, uh, Microsoft announced uh, sort of our new software for the phones yesterday morning, but what you get on a phone today is what you had on a laptop about three or four years ago in terms of display, in terms of resolution, storage, communication. And so it is the phone that's moving very, very quickly. But there's another area that's driving a lot of the technology changes again, and that's on the television. Because we're seeing television go from analog devices to digital devices to connected devices to wireless devices to on-demand um, and that domain is changing faster than cell phones were changing. And so the strategy that we've got as a company is looking at these three screens and how these three screens tie together and what your experiences are across those three screens. It's what you're trying to do on those three screens and you want to be able to access and share and collaborate on your phone as much as you do on your PC. And as we're seeing changing in the home, the home television set is becoming that portal. And there's a fundamental change that's happening in the economics of computers today. And the economics are not, no longer being driven by the electronics of the device, by the display size of the device. The economics today are really being driven by the ability of the user to collaborate and to communicate. So today we see telcos and cell phone carriers giving away a netbook. A netbook costs about depending on what country you're in, about three or $400, maybe a little bit more. But we're seeing telcos give you a netbook when you sign up for a 3G account. And so the value of that technology is really moving beyond the technology and the underlying components and much more to what you can do with it. And the business models are going to change very rapidly around the pieces that you are, the devices you carry with you, where you can work, and how quickly you can respond to dynamic changes. We're trying to address this in really two distinct pieces. The first one is in the data center and what we're doing in the data center, whether it's your data center or all the way through the cloud. And then some more interesting work that's going on around user-centric computing, which is what does the computing mean to me as an individual? How do I interact with these three screens? How do I behave with them? How do I get to my information? And how can I change? So let's take a quick look at some of those things. Here you're seeing the user-centric computing. Again, in this case, I'm thinking about collaboration, which is around mail, around document sharing, about an analytics, about being able to communicate and collaborate fairly quickly, and how that maps to those three devices and the cloud, to the three screens in the cloud. So if you look at the investments that we're making, the investments cover a broad series of devices, from PCs through servers, through handheld, through pocket devices, through cameras, um, through the ability to navigate and share and communicate, all the way through 
some very interesting and different ways that we see people reacting with the computing surfaces that exist around them. So let's look at a couple of examples of that. Um, this is from Xbox. This is the Xbox Live interface that you get where you sign on to Xbox Live. You pick an avatar. You decide who you want to be inside of Xbox Live. You decide what clothes you want to wear. You decide what color your hair is going to be. You decide what kind of personality you want to have as an avatar. Now inside of Xbox Live, this is pretty interesting, Xbox Live today has over 20 million people active every day inside of Xbox Live. Xbox Live is actually the largest television network uh, as a cable network today in terms of number of houses and numbers of end users. But we've learned a lot more than just cute avatars uh, and what they can do in that environment. What we've learned about fairly dramatically in the Xbox Live environment is how people are learning to communicate and to collaborate with each other rather than sitting on a piece of email or a piece of SMS and typing we are learning about how people can interact socially with one another in a virtual environment. So that's the sort of first part of user experiences that we're investigating. There's another interesting project which you'll see here, which is a project, again, out of the Xbox team called Project Natal. And Project Natal is about how you as a user interact with a gaming system without any controllers. It's about stereo cameras who look at you, who can see when you make a gesture like this, or in this game that you see, it's a game called Ricochet. Um, this lady is standing in open space and she's actually playing in a football game. And she goes and she kicks a virtual soccer ball and it reacts on the screen. So again, from a gaming perspective, it's pretty interesting. But we can then transform this and translate this into a modern world, which is that I might be sitting on a desktop, a big virtual touch screen, and when I do a motion like that, I'm trying to establish a workspace. And when I change my hands like that, it means open the document or turn the page. So instead of having to pick up a mouse and click on a menu and tell the system what you want it to do, the interactions are much more about intuition. It's about the system trying to understand what it is that you're trying to do. It's about the system being predictive of your intent and knowing when you go like this, it means one thing, and when you go like that, it means something else. So, Although we have these incredibly interesting gaming environments, this is not about gaming. This is actually about early experiments in trying to understand how people interact with systems, how they behave with systems. How are people going to work with touch systems? So as you might have seen, Microsoft has a product called the Microsoft Surface that looks like a table that you can walk up and touch and do things on the table. So one of the experiments that we run is we just put one of these tables into a room and we leave it there inside of an airport or a hotel, and then we watch what people do. And you'll be amazed. People will come up and they'll touch the table and do things, and they very quickly learn the interface, because the interface is very natural in the way they use it. And so this natural interface is, is moving from mice click movement menu typing much more into a very intuitive interface in the way you interact with the systems around you. Uh, and so we're actually experimenting in many places there. I'll show you um, this example of that in a minute. But part of what we have to do to underlie this in order to be able to do that is provide a computing platform that has all of the ability to do the speech recognition, the video pattern recognition. The amount of computing power that's required to look at my hand movement without ever having seen me and understand that movement using stereo cameras is a big software problem. It's not a hardware problem. The hardware is too cheap webcams to do it, but the software to be able to track my hand and understand the difference between that and the difference between my hand going like this, that's a hard software problem. So in order to do that, you need this very strong computing platform that sits behind that. And we think we'll see people moving from this sort of traditional data center, and they'll be moving over time into different back-end computing models. The first step, which is one of the things we see happening today, is the movement to the virtualized data center, going from physical devices into virtualized management of the data center. There are advantages of consolidation, of operational efficiency, even of energy savings in order to do that. And we see many customers today moving in this environment. But it's going to move very quickly. And it's going to move very quickly, firstly, into what's called private clouds, and then, more interestingly, 
into public clouds, which are very large, elastic computing environments that sit at the end of an internet pipe that allows you as a simple developer to be able to build incredibly large applications that can scale and shrink in real time, provide you with infinite storage, guaranteed availability, but with some real key underlying factors that it looks and feels to you exactly the same as a developer as if it was running on a server underneath your desk or this big large cloud in the sky. The developer experience should be the same. The skill sets that you have today developing in Visual Basic or C Sharp or whatever the languages are that you develop in, those should be the common environment that you use and the back end that your system runs on should be completely transparent. You shouldn't have to learn anything dramatically new in order to be able to do that. And so a big area of investment for us is actually moving out these data centers, constructing these cloud data centers around the world. We recently opened one in Europe in Dublin and we're developing them over time. The unit of deployment in those data centers is a container, a container that you would get onto a ship. And that container has 10,000 servers on it. And every week we drop a new container in to that data center. And the container is completely self-contained. It has all of the servers on it. It has all the power distribution, all the network connection. And it's built in a factory for us and we just drop these containers in over time that really sort of very, very allow, allow us to grow that capacity in real time. The underlying part of this again is the choice that you have in terms of the operational environment. There's a huge number of underlying technologies that we have to develop to enable that to happen. Some of it just simply is modeling. It's being able to model the environment, to be able to manage the environment. I mean, if you think of the problem of managing servers, these data centers that we're building today have up to, you know, some of them are 100,000 servers, some of them are 500,000 servers. How do you manage that many? And so there's a lot of technology that we're developing that is coming down into the enterprises that will allow you to see the advantage of a lot of the research that we're doing in that back end. This then evolves into an overall architecture that we call software plus services that talks about your data center or the clouds and the availability of different kinds of services. And then on that ring are all of these various devices, the three screens that we talk about, that allow you to connect into that common set of services. The hard part of this is defining the core set of services that sit at the middle that you want to be able to share and reuse across all of those various client environments. And I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to pick the one on the end over here, which is the car. How can I take an automobile and hook it into this environment? So we've actually got a little video that I want to show you, which is some, word, some work that Microsoft has done together with Ford. So if we can run that video, please. the video. We're coming. Hey, Amy. Hey, so are you coming to the party tonight? Oh, I'm definitely going to the party. Have you heard from Todd? Do you think he's going to show? You know what? I haven't heard from him yet. But I'm getting a text. Let me check and call you back. Incoming text from Todd. Hey, we'll definitely be there tonight. Sync. Say a command. Play artist bullet train. Playing artist bullet train. Say the name of a sport or say, tell me my choices. Football. NFL. Here are the latest NFL scores. Seattle Seahawks. On Sunday, the Seahawks edge the Rams 23 to 20. For more about this. So do we have everything ready for the meeting today? Yeah, I think we do. Can you stop at Alyssa's Deli and get some of their bagels so we can work through lunch? You got it. See you then. Services. Which service do you want? Business search. Okay, what business or type of business are you looking for? Alyssa's Bagels. Okay, Alyssa's Bagels. At night. Directions. Just a moment. Well, I'm not to to your vehicle. In one quarter mile, turn right on Lake Street.
services. Services. Which service do you want? Traffic to work. Traffic to work. Hang on while I look that up. Here's your traffic. If you take 520, there's an accident at 100 Eighth Avenue, Northeast. So what you saw there wasn't a demonstration. This is actually a real product that's available today. Um, it's sold by Ford uh, with a lot of work that's done together with Microsoft with this voice back end that is a product called Tell Me. Um, so two parts to that video. The first part is the easiest part, which is you're talking to um, your car and you're saying, play this music or answer my telephone or dial. And in that case, all of the interactions are taking place in the car. The second part of it is where the good stuff happens. Um, it's where uh, the lady dials in and says business services. And what's happening is that the car is connecting through the Tell Me server, which is a cloud service, and the Tell Me server is then hooking up into the back end. So in this car is a permanent cell phone connection, which you don't even know about, um, that hooks into this back end. And then she does a search and says, can you find me a bagel place close to where I am? In order to do that, the car has to take its GPS coordinates and send that to the back end. There's a connection that's done to Bing, which says, find a bagel restaurant that's close to these coordinates. It comes back with those coordinates. You then go back again and say, well, give me directions to whatever the bagel place was called. It goes back, does another search on maps, another search on directions, comes back down to the car again, projects that back to the car, and you go on and on and on as this sort of continues. The same part with the traffic, he dials into the system and says, show me the traffic going to work, and it comes back and says, well, avoid this intersection. At the end, there was a portal that you see, and what's happening in that portal is you're configuring your personality in the portal. So you go offline, you dial up to the portal, you tell him what home means, because he says, take me home or take me to work. So you establish names of addresses in the portal that allows you to say, take me to work. So all of that is a personalization that's done of a cloud service, and all of this voice interaction is all done through cloud as well. So the voice is captured locally in the car. It's sent using VoiceML as an HTTP push to the cloud service. The HTTP comes in to tell me, converts the voice message into text, sends that as a series of commands into the backend systems. This is when people talk about the cloud integration and actually taking end user devices and connecting to the cloud. This is a perfect example of a software plus services environment. What's interesting in this case is that this product inside of the Ford car, at least in the US, sells for $300. It's a $300 option. And many of you know if you buy an Audi or a BMW, the GPS voice system is more like $2,000 or $3,000. And so part of what's happening here is that the economics of these kinds of things are changing dramatically because a lot of the hard engineering work is now being embedded in this underlying technology. So when you think about the cloud, you should think about it in three ways. The first one is move to the cloud. It's like taking your email system that you've got today or taking a SharePoint system that you've got today and just moving it all to the cloud. Thanks very much, I don't wanna run anything by self. I'm just gonna move it to the cloud. That's actually one of the simpler things to do. You migrate your mailboxes and you can move over today. Use the cloud is, is much more interesting. The use the cloud is the example you just saw, which is allowing me to write some software that runs locally, to write some software that's in the cloud, and integrate those two together, generally using web services as an architecture to do that. And that was the tell me example that you saw. And then the final one is be the cloud, which is, as companies develop technologies, develop the ability to be the cloud, they project their services out. An example of this would be Federal Express or DHL project out web services if you're trying to find a package, you're trying to locate a package that's being shipped. Many of the airlines today also project out web services that allow you to make a reservation or allow you to look on the status of a flight. So as you're thinking about cloud level integration, it's important to think about what model you want to operate in, because there are these, at least these three models, 
And over time, there'll probably be more as we get hybrid variants of these particular models. The platforms that we've got um, in this space sort of s sit in that general view, in that middle part, which is taking advantage of the cloud and the series of products that we have that do that are around the Windows Azure platform. Windows Azure, which is the operating system in the cloud, .NET services, which is the underlying language runtimes, and then Microsoft SQL Azure, which is data storage in the cloud. What does it mean to have infinite data storage in the cloud, where you have reliability, availability, but infinite elasticity in the database server, where you can start off small and go huge in order to do that? And so that is the underlying platforms that we build on top of this infrastructure that we call Global Foundation Services, which are those racks of equipment that I talked to you about and the people who support that. The availability of this is going to be around our developer conference, which is in November, is when these particular features are generally available. You can experiment with them today if you just go to azure.net, azure.com, I think. Uh, Windowsazure.com, you'll actually be able to get in and start to experiment and play. But the important part of this is the languages, the skill sets, the development skills that you've got today are completely applicable to this environment. If you're programming in a Microsoft environment today, the same set of skills applies, the same sets of technologies applies. And so we've then looked at who are some companies that are building in our environment. And it's companies you probably would recognize. Um, some of the largest companies that we know of, in this case, you're seeing Tesco, uh, MySpace, Dell, uh, eBay, uh, even MSN, believe it or not. All of these technologies are written, or these massive websites are written today in our technologies. And the Microsoft websites are slowly moving into this hosted environment. And so if you then sit back and think about the environment that's happening today, hang on, let me go back a slide here. No, there you go. In the environment that we're happening today, when we think about content development and content management in the advertising space, in the e-commerce space, in the marketing space, we think of it in the enterprise web in sort of these several areas. Um, one is around digital marketing and how you communicate, how you manage your marketing, how do you understand your spend, how do you track the result of your spend inside of that marketplace. And then underlying that are the customer experiences, and I gave you some examples of some very different customer experiences that you might get. And all of those are then built on some, some fundamental services around uh, social computing, around the ability to publish and manage your content in a reliable way, to stage your content so that certain things only happen on a certain day at a certain time, and then the underlying commerce engines that allow you to drive the behaviors towards that. The top part of that is really driven today, it's business driven. It's driven by the ability to you to track your products, market your products, brand your products, track the brand in itself in the various environments. And the underlying IT piece is really that bottom piece. I happen to think the IT piece is pretty important because no matter how good your marketing is, if you don't have the underlying infrastructure working, it's a problem. So we actually want to be able to look at that and have different kinds of conversations, one with the CIO, one with the chief marketing officer, one with the VP of sales, because each one of them is interested in different sets of information and different sets of data that come out of the system. If you actually look at the breadth of the products that we support, we, Microsoft actually has offerings in the breadth of that space, all the way from the underlying technology through the marketing pieces and in formats and in structures and in tools that are very, very familiar to you today. But we do see some disruptions that are happening. We see disruptions that are happening from digital marketing agencies coming from the top down, as well as system integrators coming from the bottom up, creating a big blur in the middle of this picture about where the responsibilities lie to tackle these various pieces. And Microsoft's job as a technology provider is to provide you with the tools to allow you to do that, but to also give each one of you the ability to decide where you want to play in that stack and where you want to participate within those various technologies. We have a broad set of offerings that cross over across all of these pieces, both at the technology level, but also, frankly, in the services level. The services being around search, around mapping, around voice, as you saw. That Tell Me service, by the way, has been running for five years with 99.995% availability over five years. It runs in three data centers. It has to be available all the time, and it is. And that's just a great example of some of the services, the underlying services that we're providing 
but then also through partnerships through other organizations who are then using our technology set are publishing their services in this very common sort of familiar environment. And so we have this vision around what content management is going to look like over time and really where some of the thinking is today. So the first part that we think about is around building rich user interfaces. How do you build a user interface that's a combination of multiple media types um, that might actually be driven from a mouse, but frankly could be driven by voice, that could be driven by touch? How do you build those user interfaces? And this is where Silverlight as a technology that we've got provides the underlying framework to be able to do that. You also need to be able to leverage the existing development technologies, authoring technologies that you're familiar with. And then, how do we help you provision large, high volume, high scalable um, web services or web servers or, or interfaces or programs or portals, but at the same time allowing you to start small. So start small, how do we allow you to grow in those underlying platforms? So we think about the content management problem is really about these three core pieces. Here's a simple example. You want to build podcasting into your existing portal. Well, within SharePoint today, there's a toolkit that's available that allows you through gathering a series of SharePoint parts to very, very quickly add um, podcasting into your website. And it has the authoring, it has rankings, it has ratings, it has publishing. We use this internally in Microsoft where we actually push a lot of our training and readiness through something we call Academy Mobile that gets pushed to your mobile device so that the Microsoft salespeople yeah, have on their devices the latest training that they need downloadable. Manage through this very similar environment to what you see here today. And so there's lots of bits and pieces that we've got today that can accelerate your development, that, that can help you get the early versions of your portals up and running quickly. And in this case, starting off with something like SharePoint allows you to get there very, very quickly in, in terms of getting your pieces done. Silverlight is the sort of framework that underlies the user interface where it can do interesting graphic rasterization of text, it can do video streaming in lots of different ways. And we've got some things available today that will help you both develop video content, manage the video content, edit the video content, through expression and expression blend, which are the tools that we have to do that, all the way through a portal that we've got where we will give you access to be, allow you to stream that content using Silverlight Streaming back through those clients. And those clients, by the way, have to be able to cross those three, uh, three screens in a cloud environment. So we need to be able to project that Silverlight content out. Another interesting view of Silverlight is although Silverlight is cross-platform, it'll run in lots of different browser types, one of the interesting things about Silverlight is it's a contained environment. And in that case, is actually very, very secure because from attack, it's, it's much harder to actually develop an attack into Silverlight as it is into any of the other browsers because of this closed environment. So we see many banks, for example, developing their internet banking solutions in a browser but using Silverlight as the runtime in the browser because it is much more secure than allowing you to build your application in a reliable sort of closed fashion still inside of the browser. Oh, I'm moving slides. Um, on the internet marketing side, there's a whole series of pieces that we're thinking very deeply of. The most core pieces are what is in your website today? How can you get the analytics of what's going on in your website? And then some demos that I'll show you, just a quick screenshot, of how you manage your brand from a BI perspective. So some of the common analytics that you see today around search and so on, around how often your website's being hit, who's coming, what are they searching for, what are they looking for, are they finding stuff, are they clicking through, all of that is pretty standard analytics that you can expect on any sort of search environment today. But there's some other pieces that we think are much more interesting, which is to start to think about this bigger, broader problem. If you actually want to think about products or a service that you're offering and the places that you want to go, it's not just about search. It's about all of the interactions that exist around the product. It's about what people are looking at on their phones. It's about SMS messages. It's about what they're blogging. It's about what you see in a touch screen in a store. It's about what happens on a call center using the voice pieces that I talked about. All of these various dimensions are where people are touching your product, looking at your product. It's where all of the impressions are about the service or product that you're providing. And so the trick is, how do you connect those together? 
How do you provide a meta schema, some metadata, some search, some analytics that allow you to look at each and every one of these environments, each and every one of these bubbles, and tie them together? Because that is really the true part of your brand. That is really the true reflection of where your products, your, product, your product, your store, your service, whatever it is you're providing, this is really what's being said. And so we think about this problem much more from a, a more holistic view of the brand management. How do we manage your brand? How do you manage the community around your brand? And so there's some experiments that we've done. There's a little project called Looking Glass. And Looking Glass, you see a screenshot over here, is a series of analytics that look at all of the blogs, for example, and look at what the blogs are saying about your product or your service. It looks at Twitter and sees what's going on on Twitter about it. It looks at SMS streams, if it can, to be able to do that. It looks at search streams, if it can, to do that. It actually searches and mines multiple sources so that you, in real time, can get a much better understanding of what is going on around your product. And one of the things that we see here is the dynamics of that feedback the time horizons are shortening. You used to be able to do market research when you, were in a, when you were in a magazine. You would do it once a month or once every six months. But when you've got technologies like Twitter, it happens in real time. The feedback is happening in real time. And you have to be part of that. You have to be paying attention to that to really, deep, to really, um, to really be able to look at your product and look at what the interactions are. So if you do a test market, where you actually try something in a marketplace, whether it's a physical product or a logical view of something that's on a screen, you need to be able to act in real time. And so you can either go to Twitter yourself and you can start to look at what's going on on Twitter, do a search on Twitter, or you can use an environment like this that pulls the data from Twitter, it takes the data from Technoriety or Engadget or whatever the other websites are, goes and looks at the blogs, looks at them globally, looks at them inside of your country, looks inside of a region, and pulls all that data together. And as I said, the thing that we've learned here is the change of the time horizon. This, th this technology now has to go on from years to months. We're now in weeks and we'll probably go to days. That allows you to experiment with something and try something in the marketplace and get real-time feedback. The challenge that we all have as developers is let's say you've got the feedback. Now what do you do with it? So you have to be able to deal with the feedback and make the changes to your system in real time. And so the pace of our business is changing dramatically. The pace of the business is going, as I said, from one, months and weeks down to days for the ability to you to be able to publish content, to be able to change content, and change it in real time. With tools like this, what we see people doing is also targeting different demographics, different age groups, for example, with a particular product or service, or different geographies with a product or service, and test those both at the same time, and then using these kinds of analytics to look at the behaviors and looks at the responses that you're seeing. Because the responses that you see on Twitter are gonna be very different to the responses that you see in email by age group. I'm just curious, how many of you use Twitter or read Twitter? Do you, do you look at it, do you try it? About 15 or 20%. Twitter is a very interesting environment because Twitter is going to become the place where people want to search data in real time. If you go to any of the search sites and you search for news today, you're actually searching either this morning's news or yesterday's news. But when you go to Twitter and you do a search, you're getting news as of three seconds ago because there's so much content that's going in there and there's a lot of rubbish that's there. There's a lot of stuff there that I don't really care about. There's a lot of stuff where people are talking about what they had for lunch, where they went for dinner, what clothes they're wearing, that's not important, but there's a whole set of data that's in Twitter that is very important, which is around real-time feedback. When, when the hotels were blown up in Mumbai in India, whatever it was, about six months ago, the only way that information leaked out of what was going on was folks sitting in those hotels sending SMS messages to Twitter. It became the definitive source of news for that particular event. And so Twitter is going to change dramatically. If you haven't played with it, you really should. Forget about the social stuff that's in there that's interesting. But the real thing about Twitter is it's a real-time data source. You can get football results in there. You can get stock prices in there that are all very, very real, a way to do it. Another example would be, let's say you've got a phone and there's a new piece of software for your phone. How do you find out? Well, either you know somebody who tells you, 
You read it in a magazine, or you subs can subscribe to the HTC website, and they'll just tell you through Twitter. They'll publish and tell you. And so you get this pub-sub environment that happens in real time, which means that the analytics that you have that underlie this are significantly important, where Twitter becomes one source, various blogging environments become another source, search sites become another, and maybe just some surveys that you run with people. But how you instrument your applications and how you use that data in a broad sense is how we really believe that this is going to dramatically change the way digital marketing is going to happen in the future. And the future actually starts tomorrow in terms of this environment. In order to do that, and just to close, is that we see these massive opportunities to be able to, to invest in for us. And Microsoft is in this for the long term, just in the way we invest, in the way we're carving up. We think of our various groups like that in this way. And our you know, R&D investment is $9.5 billion a year. It ticks up every year a little bit more. We don't see that changing. But we see the necessity to invest across all these environments and also the ability to integrate across them and integrate the entertainment environment with the phone environment, with the computing environment, with the cloud environment, really providing three screens in a cloud as a single experience, whether you're playing, listening, or working, and that the economies of this business will change dramatically, not so much about the technology, but more about the ability of people to share and collaborate and work with one another. So we have about five minutes left for some questions. Um, there are guys with microphones, I believe, somewhere. Um, I can continue to talk a lot if you like, but um, do I have any questions? Anything, anything on Microsoft, I'll take any questions um, about this content or anything else. Has to be a question. Let me, how many of you think when you're building websites today and you're building brand tracking, are you tracking your brand? Are you actually tracking what's happening to your brand, to your product, to your service? Um, to what degree are you actually looking at the business intelligence that underlie this? Because we believe that this is going to dramatically change uh, the people who are successful or not. And that as technology developers, as IT people in this space, I think we'll see some dramatic changes. Yeah. Hello. Uh, a little question about Microsoft Azure services. Um, how, how available is it? Uh, um, do, you, do you guarantee 100% availability? And uh, uh, you also have this thing called uh, queuing service, Azure yep. queuing service. Yep. Now, um, is there any, um, because some of us are running business critical applications that are yep. running real time, mm -hmm. uh, do you uh, guarantee uh, the uh, request time that would be delivered in a number of seconds or something like yep. that? Yep. So the question is, uh, is um, around service level and service level guarantees around either the platform or underlying services that we have. And that is actually part, frankly, of the business model that we have. When you, uh, when you subscribe to some of these services, whether it's a cloud service, just the, the operating system, or whether you're subscribing to a collaboration service or a mail service, part of the contract that happens there is a commitment to availability. And we're pretty confident about that to the degree that if we miss our service levels, we actually refund. We actually believe that the biggest penalty to us is not getting paid. The penalty to you is a, a compact to your business, but our commitment is much more around it's that important to us that we actually want to be able to do that. Um, the early experiments in online, well, and Twitter's a good example. Sometimes it's down, sometimes it's not. This is commercially available stuff. We're betting our business all of the services that we provide run in that environment. So Live ID runs in that environment. Hotmail runs that environment. When, if Hotmail goes down, and it doesn't go down very often, we get a lot of mail about what's wrong with it. So we get a lot of feedback. So the commercial offerings, yes, they actually are commitments that we will sign around availability. What's interesting about that is in the service level, if we're guaranteeing that service level, it doesn't really matter how many incidents you have. You know, today in some of our support contracts, we're worried about incidents. In this case, it's as many incidents as it takes to get that service level back up. We do have a lot of good experience. Like I talked about that voice service, 99.995 over five years. It's actually down eight minutes, total time down eight minutes in five years. It runs in three data centers. And so we do understand the issues around availability, backup, support, 
geo distribution of data. Um, all of those issues are actually built in underneath. And it's a choice that you make as a developer if you want to get distributed backup, you know, if you want to make sure that your data is going to be held in different data centers. It's all part of the contractual arrangement, but with it comes the commitment and the service level that's attached to it. So it's, it's a business model question, but we believe the strongest answer that we can have is we think that financially um, we'll take the hit. If we don't miss it, we'll take the penalty. So we have a big incentive to make sure that it's still available. Question on the side here. If it works, yeah, it does. Yes. Um, T t tell us more about how you see the advertising, online advertising bu business models evolving and starting from Google Bing and towards Facebook, Twitter. How is the view from Redmond on this issue? So uh, the question is around advertising models and advertising business models uh, changing. Um, yeah, the the, the half-life of um, technology moved much quicker than the half-life of many other products and services. We thought that you know, shipping windows every two or three years um, was fast. Um, the advertising business is changing dramatically. Um, we, th we believe, as I was saying earlier, that it's a l it'll be a lot more um, than just around finding things, but it'll be around the underlying business models of helping people make decisions. Today, most of the decisions about, I'm looking for something and I want to buy it. Um, that's where the revenue is. All the other stuff is actually interesting, but the revenue is when I'm click through and I want to buy. We think that actually is a much bigger thing. It's actually about helping people make decisions. And there's value in decisions. Not only is there value in purchasing, but there are real value in, in decisions and how decisions are made. So when you, you look at the way that we're describing Bing as an example, Bing is described as a decision assistant to help you navigate through all of this information, whether that information is on the internet or help, uh, is on it locally, to be able to get there. We also believe that some of the syndicated models that are there today are also going to change dramatically because one of the incredible powers of the internet has been the disintermediation. It's been ab about pulling people out in the middle. And so some of the syndication that's there today, we see the dynamics of that changing dramatically as well and a closer connection between the consumer and the advertiser. Not, yeah, and the ability for the, the advertiser through an agency, this is not about the agency because the agent, you'll always need the agencies to do their creative and the structure but about the advertiser being able to reach out to their consumer, whether it's a business or, or, cons or sort of home consumer, being able to reach out to them and really understand much more deeply what their preferences are and what their feedback is and, be, and able to get that, that information in almost real time. So that's why I think when I talk about what Twitter's doing, Twitter's shortening that life cycle down very dramatically. And there are companies who are experimenting with uh, navigating through the Twitter data is just as important as navigating through search data to be able to get down to that level. So I think the impacts in the advertising are going to be a much closer relationship to the end user and also a compression of time like we've never seen because you can now experiment much more quickly. You can test things quickly. You can investigate quickly. And the, when it comes to picking winners and losers as, as sort of companies producing products and services, I think it's going to be the companies who can move quickly, who can try a product, test a product, do a beta on a product. We, in a technology, we do that all the time. Try this thing. Give me some feedback. If you're making a car, it's a big bet to do a beta. There aren't no betas. You either get it right or you don't. So I think that'll change. I think that'll change dramatically. There was a this question at the back. Ladies and gentlemen, no? this we're done? Is, yeah, we don't have any more time. This is the end of the panel. Thank you for your attention and thank Mr. Judah for the great presentation. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much.